Uh, I'll be leaving a uh, week on Monday for England. This will be the 21st year that I've gone back since we moved back to the States in 1992. I've been able to be blessed to be able to raise the support and go every year. Started out once a year, now gotten to twice a year, March and October, and then a couple of occasions I've actually gone at different times as well for a couple of fun funerals. do appreciate the opportunity of being here today and to be part of this lectureship again. Appreciate uh, the elders of the congregation here and Brother David for the work that they do as well as all of the members of the congregation and their involvement. Also want to say thank you to Kenneth and no, Nancy's not in here to thank them for their gracious hospitality. We're going to be talking about love this morning. You know, when we think about this word love in the English language, it has a variety of meanings. I love rhubarb pie. Or like. Children, we, are to, we say, love to ape their parents or delight to do that. And then there's that sentimental, mushy kind of love that's often seen in the popular songs of the day. It's also used when we speak of that romantic love between a husband and a wife. This is not the use of the word love that we're considering at this time. But I believe it's very vital that we study how our Lord confronts error concerning love. Indeed, there was much error in the first century concerning love, and today is, is no different. Not only in the world and in denominationalism, but sadly, even among brethren in the Lord's church. Our study will show that Jesus confronted such error and refuted it, and we should follow his example in confronting error with regards to love. At this point, I want to just mention a few things here concerning the Greek language in which the New Testament was originally written because the, New Te the Greek language does not have the limitations that we see in the English language. Because there are several words that are used with respect to love depending upon the kind of love they were speaking about or writing about. In the New Testament, and particularly in the words of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, there are two words that were used most often that are usually translated love in our English translations. These Greek words are in the noun form agape and philanthropia, and the verb Agapeo and phileo. The more common word is the verb agapeo, 142 times, and its noun form, agape, sometimes translated in the King James with the word charity. And the less common word is the word phileo. The higher and the nobler word is the word agapeo. And I've listed in the book some information taken from Thayer and from W.E. Vines, as well as the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, speaking about the different usages of the term. I'm not going to spend a lot of time dealing with this in the presentation this morning, but I would encourage you to look at the book and see the information that's there in order to be able to get a greater grasp or greater understanding. W. E. Vines, though, has said that uh, concerning the word agapeo, it is the characteristic word of Christianity. And since the spirit of revelation has used it to express ideas previously unknown, inquiry into its use whether in Greek literature in the Septuagint throws but little light upon its distinctive meaning in the New Testament. He says about the word agape and the verb form, the noun form of those wo that word as used in the New Testament, 
is used to describe the attitude of God toward his son, the human race generally, and to such as believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Also to convey his will to his children concerning their attitude one toward another and toward all men. He also goes on to state, and I'm just going to briefly note some points from what he says. Love can be known only from its actions. Now remember we're talking about its use in the scriptures. It only be known from the actions that it prompts. Secondly, love had its perfect expression among men in the Lord Jesus Christ. He states also, Christian love has God for its primary object and expresses itself, first of all, in implicit obedience to his commands. He also states, Christian love, whether exercised toward brethren or toward men generally, is not an impulse from the feelings. It does not always run with the natural inclinations, nor does it spend itself only upon those for whom some affinity is discovered. Now, the extensive quotes that I've given in the book concerning the meaning and the usage of the words in the verb form and the noun form are given to help the reader get a better grasp of what the Lord is teaching. But let's go on into the meat of the lesson this morning. First of all, we want to think about the love of God. You know, many people today think that as long as they acknowledge that God exists and that they occasionally attend some kind of worship service on a special occasion, Christmas, Easter, so on, that they are showing their love to God. Now even while our Lord was here upon earth, there were those who believed that just a perfunctory acknowledgement of God was, was all that was necessary. But the Lord taught in such a way to make it clear that that is not acceptable. God must have first place in our lives if we are to please him. On one occasion when the Sadducees came to Jesus questioning him concerning the resurrection, he clearly showed their error of reasoning in denying the resurrection, Mark 12, 18 through 27. One of the scribes, having heard Jesus reasoning with them and having perceived that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all, Mark 12 and verse 29. Notice how our Lord responds in verses 30 and 31. The first of all the commandments is here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. And with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like namely this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. Also found in Matthew 22, 37 through 40. The reply that Jesus gave to this scribe clearly shows the erroneous concept that one could love God, but it just be in a perfunctory kind of manner. The love that we should show for God to God is that kind of a love that engages all of the heart, all of the soul, all of the mind, and all of the strength. And notice how the scribe responded to our Lord. He said our Lord had told the truth. And Jesus seeing that he had answered discreetly, told the scribe, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. Verse 34, Mark 12. Our Lord also emphasized the same thought with his statement in the Sermon on the Mount when he spoke concerning materialism. 
with respect to where we place our treasure, whether it is in heaven or upon earth. Matthew 6, 24, he said, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. If God is not in first place in our lives, we do not truly love him. If the things of the world mean more to us than God, we do not really love him. And that doesn't mean to say we've got to have an overabundance of this worldly good, of worldly goods to have that wrong attitude. It's where we place our emphasis. A similar statement's made in Luke chapter 16 and verse 13 when our Lord was talking about the matter of stewardship. Let us now move to the love of neighbors. Jesus emphasized the importance also of loving one's neighbor. He said this is only second to the commandment to love God with all of one's heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. Mark 12, 31. Matthew 23, 39. There was one occasion when uh, Jesus was asked the question, Who is my neighbor? There was a young lawyer that came to Jesus tempting him. Luke 10 verse 25, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Our Lord responded, verse 26, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And again the lawyer responded, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. Verse 27 of Luke 10. Our Lord answered and said, Thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt live. Verse 28. And it was at this point that the lawyer then, wanting to justify himself, Ask Jesus the question, who is my neighbor? Jesus then goes on to tell the story of the Good Samaritan that we know it as. Look, look what we written in Luke 10, beginning at verse 30. And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment, and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him he passed by on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him and went to him. And bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence, and gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. So here we see Jesus has laid the foundation. He's given a story, and he's asked the young lawyer to answer his own question. And so he asked the lawyer, which of the three, the priest, the Levite, or the Samaritan, was neighbor to the man that fell among thieves? The lawyer responded, saying, that it was the one who showed mercy to the man who fell among thieves. Here was the priest and the Levite, leaders of the Jews religiously. Oh, they saw what the situation was, but they passed by. They did absolutely nothing. And then there was this Samaritan. 
who saw the man, took pity on him, and provided that which was necessary for that man's recovery. Jesus responded to the young lawyer by saying to him, Go and do thou likewise. That's 36 and 37. You know, I'm sure it wasn't easy for that young lawyer to say that the one who showed mercy was the neighbor. Because that one that showed mercy was a Samaritan. And scripture tells us very clearly what the Jews thought about the Samaritans. You know, it's kind of the situation that you can imagine the young man was about choking when he said it. To have to admit that the one who showed love for a neighbor was a despised Samaritan. Indeed, we're told in Scripture that Jews would make a huge detour when traveling to avoid going through the territory of the Samaritans because they didn't have dealings with them, John 4 and verse 9. But not only did Jesus point out the error concerning their love for neighbors, but also the error concerning their enemies. For they were not only to love their neighbors, but were to love even those who were their enemies. The Jews restricted their love to certain people, namely fellow Jews. And this was a bitter pill indeed for them to swallow, that they were to love even their enemies. You know, this was one of the problems that Jonah had when he was told to go and preach to Nineveh, that great city. And because of what was said, what did he do? He went and got a ship that was going in the opposite direction. Rather than have to go to Nineveh to preach. And it took some time being spent in the belly of the great fish for Jonah to come to his senses and finally do what God said and go and preach what God had bidden him. The book of Jonah gives us that complete story. You know, such is hard for many to even accept today. But notice what our Lord said, Matthew 5, 43 through 46. You have heard that it has been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same. Note how Jesus asked what reward they and indeed us have if they or we only love those that love us. Even the despised publicans did that. In Luke's record, he asks what love they have if they just love those who love them or if they just do good to those who do good to them or if they just lend to those from whom they hope to receive back. He says, even sinners do those things. And then he states, but love your enemies and do good and lend hope for nothing again and your reward shall be great and ye shall be the children of the highest. For he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. We indeed are to love our enemies if we are to be children of the highest. How can we be children of the highest if we do not love our enemies? Now I want to say something here because sometimes people don't like what's said and done, particularly during the lectureship here and in other places. Because we point out error and we refer to those who are false teachers. And they say that's not loving. Well, just think about it for a moment. If you truly love someone... 
What are you trying to do? Do you just let them fall over the cliff if they're on the edge of the cliff? Or do you do something to try and stop them going over? We seek to get those who have gone into error, those who have apostatized from the truth. In love, we reach out to them seeking their repentance before it is eternally too late. And also when we point out the error that is being taught, we do so in order that others, because we love them, we do not want them to fall into the same trap. And turn away from the truth. Love involves correction. Love involves discipline. But let's move on. Jesus also speaks about the love that disciples are to have one for another. He said, a new commandment I give unto you. That ye love one another as I have loved you. That ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples. If ye have love one to another. Note the instruction here comes in the form of a new command of a commandment. Indeed a new commandment. John 13, 34. It's not something that is optional for one who is a disciple of our Lord and Savior. Loving the brethren is a requirement for one to be a disciple, to be a Christian. But Jesus did not just command this. He lived it. He gave us the example. John 17, 34, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Just prior to giving the new commandment, we read in John 13, where Jesus washed the feet of his disciples, verses 3 through 15, setting the disciples an example of loving service one to another. He didn't institute a foot washing ceremony, but he did give an example of humility, of loving one another. Willing to be do even the menial tasks. Why did Jesus say it was a new commandment that he was giving? John 13, 34. The command to what love one's neighbor was as old as the law. Luke, Leviticus 19, 18. But the establishment of a new community. The church of our Lord. The brethren would be expected to have a special love one for another. A love that was patterned after the love of the Savior that he had had for them. To the end or to the uttermost. John 13 and 1. That Jesus called it a new commandment. Is proof enough that it was to be a love that was far superior to that which had been enjoined upon man before. Later on in John 15, 13, our Lord stated, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man laid down his life for his friends. And he followed that statement by saying, Ye are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Jesus' example of love for the brethren led him to Calvary's cross. Led him to that agonizing death upon the cross. In order that by the shedding of his blood for the remission of sins. Matthew 26, 28. He was able to provide salvation. He made salvation available. Hebrews 5, 8 and 9 tells us. To all that obey him. During the first century, even the enemies of Christians remarked concerning how the Christians loved one another. As deeds, the philosopher said, falsehood is not found among them, and they love one another. 
And from widows they do not turn away their esteem and they deliver the orphan from him who treats him harshly. Indeed, it has been well said that love one for another amongst the disciples is the true badge of discipleship. We, as we mentioned before, cannot overlook sin in our brothers and sisters or false teaching. We remember how Paul told the congregation there at Corinth concerning what they had failed to do with respect to the one who had his father's wife. And he commanded them, verse 5 of chapter 5, Deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. And later on, after the necessary action had taken place of withdrawal of fellowship, and after the brother repented, Paul exhorted them to forgive him, to comfort him, and to confirm their love toward him. 2 Corinthians 2, 7 and 8. Note what Paul said. Confirm your love. He didn't say start loving him again. They always were to love him. And loving him involved dealing with the problem. Disciplining him and withdrawing from him. But they still loved him. And then on another occasion, Paul had to withstand Peter to his face because of his sin. In separating from the Gentiles and Antioch, when certain Jewish brethren came there, and his actions also caused Barnabas to be carried away into this era. Galatians 2, 11 through 14. Our Lord also had things to say about the love of wrong things. He taught against the wrong kind of love. In his teaching on prayer, we find in Matthew 6 and verse 5, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the street, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. He spoke of the scribes and the Pharisees who sought out the highest positions at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues. That is, the most prominent positions. Matthew 23, 5 and 6. Luke eleven forty three 43 and ch chapter 20, verse 46. Again he warned. Mark 12, 38. Beware of the scribes, which love to go in long cloning and love salutations in the marketplace. Jesus also spoke concerning those who believed on him, but would not confess him because they loved the praise of men. John 12, 42, 43. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Sadly, that is often true today, even in the Lord's church. There are those who recognize the truth and accept the truth, but they are unwilling to leave their current associations. And the honor that they receive therein. Oh, they've already spoken out in the past about certain false teachings. But when someone comes along teaching those doctrines that, that they have a close affinity to. Then they have to show their love for those brethren. Rather than their love for the Lord. Brothers and sisters, it breaks my heart, but that's what we've seen happening since about 2005. So many that once seemed to stand firm for the truth, they would love those who are in error rather than loving God and correcting that situation. And some, recognizing the truth, 
would rather have the association with these others that would praise them and pat them on the back rather than take a stand against them. They'd rather be with the in crowd amongst men rather than the in crowd with God. And then, one other point we need to emphasize here is the fact that the love of God involves keeping his commandments. That concept is anathema to many people, particularly in the denominational world, but also some who claim to be members of the Lord's church. The idea that, well, we don't have to do what God says. We can love him and he is going to still love us. While I was preparing this chapter for the book, I heard an interview on Fox and Friends, uh, November the 8th, 2012. You can, should be able to go to the archives of Fox and Friends to, to see this. There was a Dr. Eben Alexander on who was being interviewed, a neurosurgeon. He was on the program because he'd written a book, Proof of Heaven, and was talking about the book, which he relates what he says was his near-death experience while suffering from meningitis. During the interview, he was asked questions that had been sent in by email from viewers. One of those questions came from a lady named Carol in London, England, and she asked the doctor whether he believed that her husband, who was an avowed atheist and who had died in the year 2006, was being punished for his unbelief. The doctor answered by saying, Oh no, he's not being punished because God loves so much. Another questioner named Maddie was missing her dog that had died and asked the doctor whether when she gets to heaven will her dog be there? And his answer was all dogs will be there because God loves all creatures. Toward the end of the segment Brian Kilme, the interviewer, asked him a question about hell. And Alexander's response was, say, he said that his experience showed him that there was no infinite eternal hell. What's that but pure universalism? Doesn't matter, man, how you live, in the end, we're all going to the same place. We're all going to heaven. Oh, yeah, and Fido will be there, too. Hmm. I think you'd be better off spending more time reading the Bible than having these uh, experiences. And maybe he needs to examine his own brain as a neurosurgeon. <laughs> Oftentimes, at funerals that are conducted by denominational preachers, we have heard the deceased being as we often say, preached into heaven. Even though he or she has expressed no real belief in Christ, nor shown by his or her life any allegiance to him. But note again, Jesus said, John 14, 15, If ye love me, keep my commandments. How can we say we love God and then do not do what he says? John 14, 21. He that love hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. John 14, 23. If, any man, if a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him. And we will come in unto him and make our abode with him. 
John 15. If you keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. 1 John 5 and 3. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. How can one say they love God when they refuse to keep his commandments? You know, there are many in this world that say they love God, but their actions speak differently. Indeed, they show the very opposite And that's not just confined to those who are in the world. We see it sometimes amongst our own brethren. There are many in the church who forsake the assembly. When we forsake the assembly, are we showing love to God? Now I'm going to quit preaching and go to meddling. When we fail to give generously as we have been prospered, are we showing love to God? You know, brethren, I believe with all my heart there are a lot of brethren whose love of their pocketbook and failure to give as they have been prospered will condemn them in the day of judgment because they have not loved God. Oh, they may seem in other ways so strong in the faith. But yet, they'll give that same amount day in, day out, week in, week out, should I say, over the years. Oh, it may have been a good sum when they first started giving. But they've had increases in wages. They've had other blessings that have, they have received uh, and their contribution remains the same. They give, but not out of the abundance that God has prospered them with. That's true, whether it be someone who is a millionaire and does not give as he's been prospered, down to someone who has limited income but chooses not to give as God would have them to give. And brethren, we need to look to our hearts when it comes to the matter of giving because a lot of the work that needs to be done in the Lord's kingdom goes undone because brethren have loved their pocketbooks their wallets and what they contain more than they've loved God. You know, sometimes you look at the contribution that comes into a congregation and you see how many there are, the kind of makeup of the congregation. But then you look at the contribution board and you see where are those who are giving as they've been prospered? And again, when we fail to read and to study God's word regularly, are we showing love to God? And then, when we fail to live as the Bible instructs, are we showing our love to God? And if we truly love God with all of the heart, with all the mind and with all the strength, we will keep the Lord's commandments the key to loving God is our obedience to Him. Do we really love God? Let us never forget what Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. We remember that the church at Ephesus was rebuked, rebuked excuse me, by the Lord because they had left their first love, Revelation 2 and verse 4. And when we fail to keep his commandments, we too have left our first love. The Lord desires us to keep his commandments 
And thus, like the church in Laodicea, he would rebuke and chasten us that we might repent. Revelation 3 and verse 19. Brothers and sisters in Christ, may we ever show our love to God in our obedience to his will. Thank you very much. You know, the first matter of business, I see David coming back. He was, I sensed that he was being a bad boy, so I made him go stand in the corner. <laughs> you feel it? You doing a little better? Yeah, in case you didn't know, David suffers from vertigo from time to time, and he said that he was feeling it coming on, so he felt like he needed to get up and, and uh, go stand up for a little while. So needless to say, we're concerned. Um, it occurs to me that uh, one of the, I hate to use the word victory in, in conjunction with the devil, but I, I'm sure he considers it a victory, is that he has so perverted the word love. It, it just uh, confronts us in, in, in all manner. I, I am, uh, on the less serious side, though, really delighted to know that my little dog that I really love <laughs> is... You're gonna gonna be there too, so that 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 heartens me. So uh, anyway, Dave, you you want to say anything now, or we just want to dismiss for? Well, what I want to do is we got the time. I want to deal with it. Okay. All right. Appreciate it. Sure. Uh, you know the premise: God loves everybody and everything. It looks like I'm going to be. Therefore, in heaven with vertigo, <laughs> or germs, or viruses, or anything else that's in this world. He loves it all. If loving it all means it's all acceptable, it's all going to be in heaven. You know, can't some people just think beyond that? It just doesn't make any sense. I'm not going to dismiss us right now. They'll be over there a little while longer. I'd like for Ken, if you will look up that site you had yesterday regarding Ricky as to what's on that church site, I'd appreciate it. Ricky responded to our stuff yesterday. Uh, Michael, uh, would you and uh, whatever your name is, John, and that uh, fellow right behind you, would y'all come down, please? All right, that's fine. I've got I have